So I think I'll go ahead and get started. Hi everyone, if you're looking for the Sierra to Sea Research Webinar, you're in the right place. Um, great job following the links and getting GoToMeeting all set up. We really hope you're going to enjoy hearing all about the research that many of you all who are on the line contributed to this summer. Um, so here's a quick preview of what we have going on today. So my name is Hitta. I'm a program manager here at Earthwatch. I'm actually talking with you live from Boston. Um, so technology can bring us a long ways in that. You all are spread all over Northern California and I'm over here on the other coast. A few other folks who are going to present today. So they include um, Jeff Laird. He's at UC Merced, Jeff Wave, there we go. You all should be able to see Jeff on your video as well. And Ben Sullivan also, who's at Univad Arena. There we've got Ben. Um, so that's, that's the agenda today. I'll start off, give an overview of everything we've done in 2015. Then we'll pass it on to Jeff, pass it on to Ben, and then we'll have a good amount of time for questions and answers. So definitely jot down those questions that you have along the way so you can ask them during the Q&A. All right. So to kick us off, I know some of you, many of you, have been out in the field this past summer, but a good place to start would be, what is Sierra to Sea all about? What are we trying to accomplish with this program? So Sierra to Sea is a new program for Earthwatch this year. So we just launched, got started on it in the spring, got a lot of great volunteers like you all out over the summer. And what we're really looking to do with the program is are, are three main things. And these are three things that are a common thread through a lot of programs that Earthwatch works with. So one is science, right? We're a citizen science organization. So scientifically, we want to assess the condition of Sierra Meadows, calculate species diversity, monitor greenhouse gas flux, all really important ways of understanding what's going on in the meadows in the Sierra. Then secondly, we science for publications or for science's sake is really important, but we want to take it to the next level in programs where we're working with people and would like for that data to be used to inform policy and action on the ground and management plans. So there's a lot of you all who are really actively involved in restoration projects in a lot of the, the watersheds around the Sierra. So sharing this research with you, we hope to be able to spur that conversation that you all can make adjustments to those programs you have going on so that we can all have healthier meadows for the future. And then lastly, but certainly not least, we want to engage people. So that's you all again, that's coming out, doing citizen science, being in the field, getting hands on, getting to experience what research data collection is like. Maybe it's your first time, maybe you've done citizen science before, but the design is that anyone could join, anyone can get the training right during the day that you're collecting data and be able to contribute. So that's what we were looking to do this last year with Sierra to Sea and going forward. So why here and why now? Why is Earthwatch interested in the Sierra in particular? And why at this point in time? So this is a nice chart that I like to show that is obviously a map of California. And it's showing what the projected and the historical climate has been for the, the high temperature in July. And the one thing that we see in this is that due to climate change, things are really warming rapidly. Things are changing significantly in the state of California, and they're changing significantly across the Sierra. So it's an important time to understand what are those impacts of climate change and how can we take practices so that we do preserve meadows, we preserve species, we preserve plants, and that those are really active ecosystems for our communities. The Sierra are also particularly important, as a lot of you probably know, um, for water for the whole state of California. So water in California comes from a lot of different places, but about a third is from snow melting up in the Sierra. And 
that contributes to a lot of the water that the rest of the state needs, a lot of the plants needs, a lot of the animals need, and a lot of what the people need. Um, climate change is increasing temperatures, it's causing drought, it's causing flooding and extreme weather and sometimes, and the chart really shows you the, the change in that weather in one way, particularly looking at snowpack. So, we were really interested after thinking about climate change, the way it's impacting a lot of different regions around the U.S. of how is this really impacting the Sierra because it's such an important place. So, from there, oh, next slide. There we go. So, who are we working with? So, we were just introduced to a few of those folks that are on video with you right now. What we started to do in getting the project off the ground was say, all right, who are some of the really talented scientists that are doing research in the Sierra already? And we talked to a whole bunch of folks and ended up working with what we thought were the best of the best, right? So Rachel Hutchinson, Ben Sullivan, Steve Hart, Jeff Laird, and Josh Fears are all different scientists we've been working with who've been designing the research questions, the protocols that everyone can contribute to to do this research. What they've been working on breaks out into two different research projects. So the first is a Meadows scorecard research project. So some of you may have been out in the field collecting data for this. You all used a standardized scorecard. You filled out boxes, checked things, measured things, and then also used iNaturalist to count biodiversity. So that is the different numbers of plants and animals that you saw in a certain period of time. Then other folks on the call, you may have participated in the greenhouse gas research where you were taking samples of um, carbon dioxide and a bunch of other greenhouse gases and looking at how did that vary across a meadow. So these are two of the main research projects that in a second um, the scientists will get into more detail of. And then looking at this, so okay. What did Earthwatch do? How did we work with everyone over the last year? So we started with what we just talked about, designing the research. Find the scientist, figure out what the research is going to be. Then secondly, we wanted to work with a lot of different nonprofit organizations and a couple companies and hiking groups and classrooms as well who are really interested in these issues and really interested in contributing by helping to collect data or by using the data. So did a lot of outreach and most of that was done. You all probably remember um, talking with Jules Winters who I know is on the call right now but a lot of her, her um, efforts went into finding great connections with you all. Then the next step was, all right, we have great people, they're really excited, let's get everyone trained up to know how to collect the data. So we held train the trainer events where team leaders, so folks who said, okay, I'll take responsibility for organizing a group, getting folks to come out, uh, took that time to go through a training, go out and try some of these methods in a meadow with Jules, and then after that you all went off to pick a date that worked really well for you and the folks that are going out to the field with you and set up citizen science data collection events. So from there, that's where many of you came into the program. You knew who your team leader was or you were a team leader, came on, collected data, had a really great time. So this is a quick summary of how much we accomplished all together over the last year. So in all, there are 96 citizen scientists who came out and collected data, and we are so grateful and thankful to every moment that you helped with collecting that data. And that wouldn't have been accomplished without the 12 team leaders who organized those events, who got trained up on the methods, did all of the planning, get those events to happen. Together, everyone surveyed 16 meadows, um, a great number of meadows that the researchers wouldn't have been able to get out to if it weren't for all of your help. With, during those surveys, you also recorded 477 species observations in iNaturalist and took 600 greenhouse gas samples. And then a little on the less scientific side, but also important, we set up a Facebook page to keep people up to date with what's going on with the program to um, have news stories from the research um, that's going on in the broader area. So 84 of you signed up for our Facebook page to stay, stay in tune with what's happening there. 
And then this I thought was a really nice map to show everyone. So I'll give you a second to kind of get oriented, right? So we've got Sacramento here, we've got Lake Tahoe, and then all of these points are all of the, those meadows that were sampled. So it's a really broad range of the area that everyone was able to cover um, and all of the meadows. It's really neat to see how much ground um, through team effort we were able to cover this year. And then I also want to say a big thank you to all of the partners who helped make this program possible. It was really through the working together of so many organizations all coming together around this mission of collecting research around the Sierra, around Meadows. So, and those with the arrow on them, those are all organizations who had a team leader who organized events. So they get an extra gold star for all of your work and efforts like that. And I want to also here take a moment and say thank you to Jules for all of the work that you did organizing, getting in touch with everyone. Um, and I hope to be able to carry that torch forward and do as good a job keeping everyone updated. So that's a quick intro summary of the program. And now I'm going to turn it over to Jeff to give you a research summary um, from the Meadows scorecard. You want to take it away, Jeff? Sure. Let's get this going. All right, can you guys see what I'm seeing? Yep. There's a... All right, so again, thanks to thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'll just kind of make this a quick quick overview of what we what we did and um, remember to write down any questions that you have and I'll, I'll answer them all at the end. So, um, so yeah, so getting started off, I just wanted to briefly go over the stuff that um, Hits had mentioned before. We, you know, reached out to you guys and we're really thankful that you all um, kind of rallied to help to help us assess all these meadows. So um, again, what we used was just this uh, assessment scorecard developed by American Rivers. Um, you know, it, it's been, it, it was built collaboratively through um, lots of reiterations and it's been vetted by a bunch of different scientists. It's really easy to learn and um, it gets some very good indicators of meadow, meadow health. And I'm, I'm sure you guys have looked at it plenty on your trip out there. Um, so to follow that up, we made uh, you know our, our web web form to help you guys put in the data that you collected when you were out with the scorecard. Um, just another way to get things, get the data entry um, from you guys. We wanted to involve you as much as possible. So yeah, um, tons of meadows surveyed. I know um, Hitta had mentioned 16. I'm not counting the uh, meadow from Train the Trainer, although we really, we appreciate you guys doing that one too. So it's just a it's a, a very wide uh, span of meadows. You know, it's a it was a great effort, and um, I think it shows. And here again, you can see the distribution. You know, all the way up and down the Sierra of all of these different meadows. Um, you know, our, our, this this map kind of shows the scores um, from the assessment too, and um, you, you can see that we had a very very wide variety of scores. Um, again, lots of participation. Very thankful. Um, huge distribution of um, stakeholders. You know, like ecologists, landowners, hikers, students. Thanks, guys. Um, scientists, tech employees, it was just, it was amazing to be a part of. So uh, let's get going on to the research objectives. And these are what we started out with um, uh, at the beginning. You know, we wanted to use these, use the scorecard, use our resources to identify certain characteristics um, in the Sierra Meadows, and we wanted to kind of map the distribution map the distribution of that. So 
you know, we thought we might be able to see, um, you know, a, a trend in Metascore along um, elevation gradients and longitudinal gradients. So, you know, kind of going from the valley up into the Sierra. Um, our second objective was just uh, more general, quantify the relative health of individual meadows. So, you know, looking at each trait, comparing it with others, and um, putting that data out, those data out to um, stakeholders and decision makers. Uh, we wanted to assess the biodiversity in the meadows, and you did that through iNaturalist. Um, I'll go over all of these later in more detail. But um, And the last one was to identify conifer encroachment along the meadow's edge. Oh. Um, well, it looks like some of the labor <laughs> labels didn't get imported, unfortunately. But um, this is just a graph showing the uh, total score of the meadow, and that's in percent of um, overall points possible. You know, you got, in the scorecard, you got one point for being, uh, for a highly impacted meadow or highly degraded, and four points for a natural condition meadow. So the higher score, the better. And as you can see, there's really no <laughs> good trend here in the distribution. So, you know, we thought we might see, um, you know, higher scores up in Northern California where there's, you know, noticeably more snowpack and, um, you know, as you can see, we, we really didn't see that. So it kind of indicates that, um, you know, the meadow scores may depend on more localized impacts such as, you know, things that affect certain watersheds or um, sub-basins. Um, same thing with the elevation. It was totally opposite of what we expected. Um, you know, higher elevation meadows are, um, as you can see, or the ones we surveyed were just as degraded or more degraded than um, lower meadows, lower elevation meadows. Um, so for our, in our biodiversity measurements, we found tons of total observations. We mapped 90 species, which is huge. Um, and these are all out in the iNaturalist database. Um, you know, we've had, and uh, these, this number 89 is just species that have been identified and confirmed. So for everything that you guys did, someone else out, you know, in California or in the world has looked at your picture and your tag and said, this is what, um, this is the species that you're looking at. And um, it's, it's really uh, making a difference in um, biodiversity mapping and species mapping. Um, it, uh, hmm. I, I must be missing a slide uh, regarding the conifer encroachment observation. Um, I think, uh, sorry. Uh, well, I, I'd just like to say on that um, that, you know, the conifer encroachment was an indicator of meadow health. Um, I think with, with uh, it, uh, you know, it's just as important as some of the other metrics, and in the scorecard it's worth just as many points. But um, we were hoping to use that and, and show the trend, and it and it does it does match up, um, and I'll be able to answer more questions about that at the end. Um, but um, as for my my personal overall observations, looking at the data, um, you know, the total score of the meadow, although it is a good indicator of you know kind of comparative health, it may not be useful to local stakeholders and decision making. Whereas individual metric scores, such as bank height or bank stability, um, might be more valuable. You know, it's some some organizations are willing to go in and kind of change the landscape in order to help restoration. Whereas other places, such as the National Park Service, um, won't change the landscape, but they'll remove encroaching conifers. 
um, like in Tuolumne Meadows. Um, also, um, most assessments in most meadows, you know, report a lot of um, healthy characteristics, you know, like most of the scores are three or four, where only one or two or maybe a few aspects are degraded. And I think that that kind of underlines the importance of these assessments and these monitoring activities because it shows that the meadows aren't necessarily unsavable. You know, you, you can take steps to um, change this one degraded aspect um, without getting kind of losing hope seeing the, uh, uh, you know, an extremely degraded meadow. Um, I think for the next steps and for, uh, you know, what we maybe could have done better in this project, um, I think, and in order to kind of create um, better data using, you know, the methods that we started perfecting in this study, you know, picking, um, what, what we did is picked area, picked meadows mostly in areas that um, were accessible and um, kind of could provide a good citizen science experience. Um, and that may have left, you know, some meadows that, you know, we didn't, we, we may have not considered some meadows based on their qualities. And, um, yeah. And also um, time and proximity. So, uh, you know, me meadows that are way out of the way or very difficult to reach weren't able to be surveyed in a study like this. Um, so again, that's something that we need to consider in the future. Um, so taking that knowledge forward, you know, refining the meadow selection processes, um, revisit our hypotheses and see, you know, um, is there something we could do better to kind of identify trends in this? You know, is, is an N of 15 enough? You know, do we need more meadows? Um, Again, the greenhouse gas emissions testing, Ben's going to go over that today. And um, really integrating the uh, biodiversity measurements into the Meadows Clearinghouse at UC Davis where all of these data will be stored. So um, again, that's that's my brief overview. If you have any questions, I, again, I'll be happy to answer them at the end. Um, I'd like to say thanks to Jules and all of her hard work. Um, thanks to Rachel and Circle and all of the team leaders. You know, we really appreciate it. So, thank you. Great. All right, Ben, it's your turn to take over. Okay, thanks, Hinta. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Here we go. Got your slide. You got your screen up now as well. Okay. I uh, should convert over to full view. There we go. All right. Thank you all for uh, patching in to find out the results of uh, our greenhouse gas measurement campaign last summer in Loney Meadow, which took place August 29th and 30th. Um, it was a lot of fun, um, and uh, I'm excited to tell you about what we found. So. A number of the participants in this project um, working work not just with EarthWatch but also broadly um, in a number of different meadows, some of which Jeff and um, Hitza showed in their maps, um, designed to try to understand how uh, meadow restoration may affect the carbon budget of meadow ecosystems. And to understand the, the carbon budget of these meadows, uh, we need to quantify changes in the soil carbon stocks, uh, which we didn't tackle in this most recent campaign. And we also need to understand the greenhouse gas budget. Um, <clears throat> anything, anytime we talk about the greenhouse gas budget, we're considering the three most important greenhouse gases con contributing to climate change uh, today, namely carbon dioxide, or CO2, methane, or CH4, and nitrous oxide, or N2O. So in, in dry or dry and nitrogen-limited soils like we would expect to find in many unrestored meadows in the Sierra, um, these, this slide shows the flux that we would typically expect to see. 
Methane and nitrous oxide are absorbed by the soil because of the, the processes associated with specific soil microorganisms. And then carbon dioxide is actually produced. And we see these fluxes because of the aerobic soil conditions in, the, in these meadows. When we look at restored meadows that are much wetter, they can have anaerobic conditions, which means that the sign of the fluxes is switched. So in this case, methane and nitrous oxide are actually produced, and carbon dioxide can even be consumed in small quantities. Uh, so this is the opposite of what we just found, or what I just showed in an unrestored meadow. So quantifying this shift in the greenhouse gas uh, fluxes and emissions from soil can be a really important component of the overall carbon budget. Um, and we want to know what the carbon budget is because uh, using California's cap and trade marketplace, there's a possibility that we might be able to uh, pay for restoration if we can uh, use the carbon credits, if, if these meadows um, sequester carbon, and then if we can use these carbon credits uh, to pay for the restoration. So on a typical uh, visit to the meadows to sample the greenhouse gas fluxes, uh, we would measure 24 points per meadow um, spaced evenly on a 30 meter grid. Um, but it's important to point out that we can typically only measure anywhere between 6 and 12 of these points uh, simultaneously. So here's a photo of my graduate student Cody Reed who's doing her master's work on this. Um, measuring a uh, static chamber, uh, a single static chamber, and so she might be able to measure six of these at any given time. Cody has to go to the field to, to collect these fluxes, and so we typically get out to the field to measure these meadows about once every three weeks, sometimes a little more frequently, sometimes a little less. And we typically sample during the same time of the day, so we're out there between 9 a.m. And, and 4 PM on, on average. And so while this might be good enough to measure uh, an annual estimate of uh, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide fluxes from the, from the soil to the atmosphere, uh, it leaves a lot of unknowns. And, and we really want to answer some of these questions to be sure that we're doing this in a robust way. So that's where we teamed up with, with Earthwatch and, and you citizen scientists to be able to provide us with a lot more uh, spatial and temporal resolution than we can possibly achieve in a regular sampling event. The questions we hope to address uh, were regarding the spatial pattern of soil greenhouse gas fluxes in these meadows. So remember I said typically we work on a 30 meter grid. Well, what happens in between those uh, points that are 30 meters apart? Are there hot spots that we're missing? Um, are these 30 meter points spatially independent from one another? What I mean by that is a, a point that has uh, high spatial dependence with another point is, is one in which if, it's, if you get a high rate of gas flux, uh, that other point also has a high rate of gas flux. We don't want spatial dependence among our samples. We actually want independence. We want them to operate independently of each other to be true replicates of, of uh, uh, statistical replicates for when we're analyzing our data um, after our measurements are taken. And so all this will help us understand if we're doing a sufficient job at capturing the greenhouse gas flux that's occurring spatially in Sierra Meadows. The other question we wanted to address was whether soil greenhouse gas fluxes have temporal patterns. So as I said, we go out once every three weeks and we sample during the same time of the day. Are we missing something important that happens in the middle of the night? We don't know because we're not generally out there in the middle of the night. And so we worked with you guys to be able to address some of these, uh, these questions. And uh, I'll show you the results of our spatial uh, patterns first. Um, after describing what we did. So, so we, uh, we used the static chamber technique, which you can see the static chamber here on the ground. It's essentially a white PVC cap um, that's actually used to cap sewer pipe. Um, and so we're, we fit that chamber uh, on the ground 
and then we sample the gas inside that chamber to see how much is produced or consumed by the soil. And so we set out about 50 of these chamber tops um, to be able to measure them, measure 50 simultaneous uh, gas flux measurements um, at about 12:30 in the middle of the day. So that's uh, 50 is a lot more than the 6 to 12 we can usually get in a typical sampling event. So we'll have a much better idea of the spatial resolution of these measurements. And then we also uh, performed uh, temporal measurements where we measured these fluxes every two hours uh, for 24 hours, beginning with that spatial measurement, which was at 1230. So we basically kept going back out to 18 of the chambers for the for every two hours for the next 24 hours. Uh, so we finished the next morning at 10:30. Okay, so here's some results from our spatial analysis. Um, here's one of our volunteers uh, excited to be collecting gas samples from the static chamber. Um, we designed this. Uh, experiment to use a, use a nested sampling scheme. Um, and what I mean by that is we, we created these little nests of samples that were closer to each other than our standard grid. Our standard grid is these blue boxes or blue dots, and they're 30 meters apart. And then we had some that were one and a half meters from the, from the grid point, and then three meters, the green dots are three meters from the, the central blue point. And then we had 5 and 10 meters from the central blue point as well. So that would allow us to, to better understand the spatial relationship among our samples all the way from 1.5 meters short to 175 meters apart. This point and this point, for example, are 175 meters apart. So I'm going to show you the results of this now using a, uh, a plotting technique called bubble plots. And so they're pretty easy to understand. A bigger bubble means a bigger gas flux. And a smaller bubble is a smaller gas flux. If it's green, it means it's a positive flux. It means it's going from the soil to the atmosphere. If it's purple, which we'll see shortly, it means that there's uh, movement of the gas from the atmosphere into the soil, or it's negative flux. OK. So when we look at this box with the greenhouse gas, uh, the carbon dioxide, fluxes shown here in the bubble plots, if we just let our eye sort of orient to what we see, um, we don't really see a whole lot of patterning. What I mean is, if there were a lot of patterns here, or if there was a strong pattern, we'd see all the big bubbles in one area of the plot and small bubbles in another area of the plot. And we don't see that. We see some big bubbles up in this corner for sure, but we also see some big bubbles next to some fairly small bubbles. So there's not a lot of spatial patterning for carbon dioxide. We see a similar effect when we look at methane. Now here we have purple because methane, again, remember, is consumed by the atmosphere in unrestored meadows. Um, and so most of these points are purple because it's a point of consumption. We see the same pattern. We have high rates of consumption next to low rates of production. So we're even getting a flip in the direction of the flux um, right next to each other, within one and a half meters. So again, there's not a lot of spatial pattern. We see the same, uh, same thing hold with nitrous oxide. Again, within one and a half meters, you can have a high rate of uptake of nitrous oxide and uh, small rates of nitrous oxide production. So we can look at this more statistically using a, an approach called a variogram. This is a sample variogram that I just drew. It's, it's sort of a theoretical one. Um, and what this is is a, a plot of the semivariance on the y-axis, which is essentially a, a metric that tells us how uh, similar, how spatially dependent uh, or related two points are, and then the distance apart that those two points might be. So I left the units off here just to, for, for demonstration purposes. But what we typically see is our data form this curve pattern uh, demonstrated by the blue line. And we look for something called the sill, which is the place at which our samples become spatially independent. And we want to make sure that our 30-meter sampling grid uh, is independent. Now I'm going to show you the variograms from the actual data. 
that we collected in our spatial sampling design for carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. The variogram itself is in the blue line, and you'll notice that it doesn't look anything like the variogram that I just showed you. In fact, at the beginning of the variogram, of each variogram, when the distances are very short, the, the semivariance is high, meaning that there's a high degree of spatial independence uh, within, uh, <clears throat> between those two points. And this is true for all three of our gases. I'll also point out that at 30 meters, we had uh, some of the highest semivariance um, of the entire uh, distances that we looked at. Um, and so that's indicating to me that our 30 meter grid design is actually uh, pretty good for getting spatial independence. Now, if you're wondering what the gray, little gray squiggly lines are, they're what's called a resampling of our data. So I uh, performed a bunch of different permutations of our data and re them to all different grid cells. Um, and then basically that allows us to see if there, was, if there was structuring of our data relative to what we might have found. Um, and what we see here is essentially that there's, there's randomness occurring. Because this blue line is regularly within the gray box or the sort of gray zone created by the squiggly lines, um, this indicates that these processes are largely spatially random at the scale we consider. They're not being driven by any physical, chemical, or biological process that's easily detectable at this scale. So I'll quickly describe the green, temporal greenhouse gas uh, analyses. I'll show you this figure that shows the carbon dioxide fluxes over the course of the 24-hour period. So this took a lot of work. It was a lot of fun. Um, it was also pretty challenging for those of us who, who were out there at 2.30 in the morning uh, collecting samples in the dark, and it was cold. Um, so I thank you for all for those efforts. Um, here are your data points. Um, on the y-axis, we have carbon dioxide flux. This is a positive value because it's production to the atmosphere. And what we see is that this 12.30 point stands out um, this was actually our spatial point, and it was the first one of the day. And then, essentially, we, we just set this so that it's, it's measured at midnight. Um, so that sort of middle of our sampling period begins over here on the left side of your screen. The important thing to take away is that these dots aren't that separate from one another. In fact, there's no significant effect of time on carbon dioxide flux. And so that indicates to us that if we go out and sample in the afternoon, we're not getting a flux that's significantly different than something that's happening in the middle of the night. The same pattern held for methane and nitrous oxide, um, even though the fluxes were very different for those other two gases, we found no significant effect of time on uh, our flux rates. So that tells us that when we go out and measure from 9 and 9 in the morning to four in the afternoon, we're doing a decent job of collecting our samples and, and not uh, biasing our flux rates. So the answers to our questions, these are what, this is what you guys helped us do, and, and it really helps us when we go back to uh, our, the other meadows that we work in. First, it tells us that our sampling design is probably sufficient. Um, the reason why we're not seeing uh, a whole lot of spatial structuring and we see a lot of randomness is because there are these gas fluxes that are likely dominated by microbial processes that are operating at much smaller scales than the one and a half meter uh, range that we were able to begin looking at. And then it also tells us that we were, uh, that we do a good enough job of, if, if we're, of, of measuring gas fluxes if we sample uh, in the middle of the, the daytime um, and we don't have to be out there every day, every time we go out, we don't have to be out there in the middle of the night, which is a relief. Um, and uh, we've seen similar results in, in forest and riparian ecosystems and other places around the world where we've done this work, but I was still surprised to see so little pattern um, temporally um, within our fluxes. So I wonder if, it, if uh, this represents the late summer I wonder if we had uh, done this in May, if we might have found a different result. Um, but uh, at least it's telling us that, that with the data that we have, our measurements are robust.
So with that, I'll, I'll take questions. Uh, I think now it's the question and answer period, and so Jeff and I will uh, address your questions to both of us. Um, thank you all. It was a huge effort to get this done, and I appreciate your, your hard work. Great. Thanks, Ben. So what we're sort of going to try and do, and we're going to see how this works, is if you have a question, just so that not everyone's turning their mics on at the same time and um, trying to talk, if you let me know in the chat box that you have a question, then I'll let you know and I'll put your, your mic on and we can take turns asking questions that way. So like typing in the chat is kind of like raising your hand. So if anyone, does anyone want to be the first one to ask a question? Oh, it looks like we've got our class here. Monica? Hi, we do have a question. Yes. Do you want to call on one of your students to go first since you know their names? Yeah, Heather. How far do you go to like investigate the meadows and stuff? How far do you go to investigate the meadows and stuff? <laughs> um, you mean kind of? I, I guess on a regular basis, you know, mostly people, the interested people, you know, people who, who. Uh, have some say in what they do on the meadows, you know, they're going to stay within their kind of organizational bubble. You know, they might go within um, one watershed or maybe a county, you know, so it's pretty localized. But other organizations like UC Davis or American Rivers um, are, you know, they're, they've done, they've assessed meadows on much larger scales, you know, so they'll go all the way up and down the Sierra to do some of these assessments. One other way I might add to that is of the groups that went out, if you think of like how far from the road people went, some people I think it was like a 15 minute walk from the road and I think the farthest one was like a three hour hike from the road. So some people had a pretty wide effort to get out to um, some of the areas. And then I see Jules has chimed in in the chat window, Ben, that you do some collection right outside of Plumas Charter School, which is where the class is, right? Am I connecting all that? Yeah, so, so I didn't realize that's where you guys are. That's great. We, uh, we work um, a little bit north of Quincy uh, in a town called Westwood. And so when you say, when you asked how far we go, sometimes in the summer it doesn't take us very long to get there, but uh, we are planning a sampling event for the next couple days, and we are going to rent a snowcat, like at ski areas, to drive into the meadows in a snowcat. And uh, depending how far we can go, we may even have to ski or snowshoe in as well. Um, so sometimes we have to do a lot of work to, to get into the meadows. When it's snowy in your backyard, it's probably snowy in the, in the meadows up there as well. All right. You said, how much time do you guys spend on studying the meadow? Mm. Um. <laughs> it really depends, you know. Uh, I think it, it depends on what you're looking at, you know. So Ben, I don't know, Ben. Do you want to do you want to take a stab? <laughs> sure. We'll be looking at the same three meadows very closely for three years, um, and that's probably just to start. Um, we're we're also looking at meadows that we restored about 15 years ago, um, and so. We obviously, we haven't invented our time machine yet, but what we can do is we can look at meadows that were freshly restored and meadows that were restored a long time ago and we can compare them. And so we can look over bigger time scales, um, like 10 to 15 years that way, rather than waiting around to see what'll happen. Yeah, so so where Ben studies, you know, are, are very long term, um, some assessments like the meadow scorecard you know, you should be able to get a good picture of each meadow, you know, in less than a day. 
Great. Thanks. I'm going to read off a question that was typed in the chat. Um, so this is from Rachel Hutchinson. Um, she doesn't have a microphone, so she's typed it in. Um, she says, this is a question for Ben. Did you do any other spatial analysis on the data than what you showed us today? That's a good question, Rachel. So uh, we did a number of different analyses on those, on those spatial results. Um, including trying to understand if there were any patterns between air temperature, soil temperature, water content in the soil, um, to see if there was any, anything that could help us explain why there were high rates in one spot and low rates in a different spot. And uh, the best predictor um, looked to be soil temperature, but there was very little variance in soil temperature. Um, and so I, there wasn't a lot of uh, ability to explain why there was a high rate in one area and a low rate in another. As I said, I think that's probably happening as a result of uh, like microbial processes that are smaller than what we were able to measure inside our, our chamber. Thanks, Ben. I've got... Um Oh, Rachel has a bit of a follow-up for that, and then Chris, you're next. I'll just read off Rachel's follow-up. Do you think this relationship will improve with bigger sample size? Yes. I think that uh, as we measure over the course of a growing season, and we have much bigger differences in, in air temperature or water contents for that, for example, we'll start to see bigger patterns emerge. Great. All right, Chris, I'm going to unmute you so that you can ask your question. Okay. Um, hi, Ben. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering if uh, you want to speak a little bit more to the, the types of gas fluxes you were seeing between the three gases. I know it was a little outside of your research questions, but um, I noticed that the carbon dioxide were mostly positive, whereas the uh, nitrous oxide and methane, it was all over the board. And so that didn't really match up with the model that you presented at the, at the beginning. So I wondered if you had some thoughts about that. Yeah, uh, it's a good question, Chris, um, and thanks for asking it. So um, generally, what we expected to find was emission of carbon dioxide from the soil, which is what we found. Um, but methane can either be produced or consumed uh, in, in these soils. And so we found, generally, uh, we found consumption, negative rates, those purple bubbles. Um, there were a few points in which there was methane production, but the production rates weren't very high um, relative to a wetland, for example. Um, and then for, for nitrous oxide, we expected to see a lot of, or some uptake of nitrous oxide um, in these drier and uh, probably nitrogen limited soils, but um, nitrous oxide can be really tricky. It doesn't like to um, doesn't like to behave the way we expect it to. And so as you pointed out, it was basically all over the place. There were some places where there was production, some places where there was uptake, and they were about balanced out. Um, they, uh, in, in essence, we had essentially zero net um, N2O flux over the, in, in either our spatial samples or over the course of the 24-hour period. So um, while it's a little bit different than what we expected, it's, it's fairly close. I wasn't entirely surprised to see nitrous oxide not behave the way, the way I expected it to. Cool. Thanks, Ben. Sure. Great. Um, anyone else have questions? I have, no one else has chimed up in the chat box. Got two great scientists right here, ready to answer whatever you want to know. I don't know, Monica. If your students have another question, you've got a whole crowd there. I imagine there might be some. So our connection's kind of lagging. We have a question. All right. Uh, what elevation would you find the uh, gas fluxes at? Sorry, I didn't. I didn't catch that. Can you repeat it again? Yeah. What elevation would you find the 
Yes. What? What elevation? Um, well, we find them at all elevations. So soil is actually teeming with life, um, and it's all mostly uh, really small microorganisms. Um, in fact, if you held a, enough soil in the palm of your hand to be about the size of a quarter, there could be uh, upwards of a million individual organisms in there. And they do a bunch of different things, like produce carbon dioxide and, and eat methane. And so these, these processes are really interesting and powerful. Um, and they can help control what's actually, what our atmospheric concentrations of these gases are. Um, and so we uh, uh, study those of what's happening in the soil to be able to understand how our environment influences our atmospheric chemistry. Um, so we see uh, carbon produced from soil, um, just dry soils. Um, so you could probably go out the, the behind the school carbon dioxide production. Um, that would be pretty normal. Um, and if the soils are fairly dry, you're generally going to find methane being consumed as well. Um, so it, it happens the place. Uh, the places we get switched is when the soils become waterlogged and really wet, and, and that's when things change. Excellent. Um, so, uh, I want to like your mountain rain. Mm. Sure. So, we're in, you know, if huge in the, of the state, so the is managed, the way water is managed, power, um, recreation, it's just, it's a huge part of, you know, everyone's life in California. And, you know, the way that these meadows fit into that, I guess, specifically meadows in the Sierras fit into that is, you know, they they store water, they filter water, and they're kind of these very unique ecosystems that, you know, you might not see in such abundance somewhere else. So, you know, why are we interested in them? Because they're interesting. You know, they're, they're, uh, they're fun to look at, and a lot of people care about, you know, maintaining them. I might I add in there a little bit, too, that meadows are particularly vulnerable to a lot of the changes that are going on, and that's part of what makes them interesting as well. So we've talked a little bit about a degraded meadow versus a healthy meadow. Um, and once a meadow gets degraded, it can't on its own very easily go back to being a healthy meadow. So it'll dry out a lot, so it won't be able to act like a sponge like it normally does holding water in. Um, but there's efforts that groups like um, like CIRCLE, like Sierra Streams Institute, and a, a whole bunch of others here who are probably on the phone right now, um, are trying to do to pick what's the right meadow to restore, like which one is going to make the biggest impact to help with the, the water issues that we've got up in the Sierra. So I might chime that in. Absolutely. So the water I drink right here came from the Sierra because I live in Reno and the Truckee River provides us all our water and it comes out of Tahoe. So I care about it. Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Same with Merced. So we have another question from Steve Dozen. If you turn your mic on, Steve, then we can hear you. Oop. Can you hear me now? I can hear yep. you now. Great. Uh, thanks for the presentation, guys. Uh, I have a question for Jeff. Um, so obviously in our first year, we were successful in uh, measuring about 15 meadows. So I think that number was correct. And uh, in moving forward into next year, as we kind of start looking at you know sample sizes and everything, are we going to be able to establish an ideal sample size, not only by quantity, but also by distribution throughout um, the Sierra, as well as access accessibility? to kind of um, 
maybe uh, determine a better sample set that we can target specifically um, in certain areas and then have uh, predefined meadows that we need to go after um, to kind of get a better distribution sample size or is it pretty much the, the more the merrier? That's a, that's a fantastic question actually. Um, so yes, I'd like to start off by saying yes, the more the merrier. Um, you know, all of these all of these assessments, you know, really are are going to make a difference to people who are interested in them. In them, I know that sounds kind of weird, but you know, a meta assessment isn't directly useful until someone uses it to, you know, have it affect a decision, or if someone, you know, picks up the data and, you know, compares it to other data in the set to kind of get a broader picture. So having said that, you know, can we target specific meadows? It, we could. It's, it's, um, it's definitely a bigger question. You know, how do we pick meadows that are representative? How do we pick meadows that, you know, are, yeah, how do we pick meadows that are representative within a watershed, within, um, a sub-watershed within a meadows system within the Sierra? So it's it's a really good question, and I don't think I can answer all of it. One thing I think that you've mentioned to me before, Jeff, is that, like, the distribution of the meadows that were measured this year compared to, like, how all the meadows are distributed across the Sierra, that we kind of hit a certain pocket of elevation, and you might find it interesting mm -hmm. to try some different elevations that we didn't quite get to. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think I, I, don't, I didn't include the graphic on the presentation, but, you know, it, it, um, we did a lot of meadow assessments on the lower elevation because those are the meadows that were accessible to us, you know, whereas there are, there's a huge subset of meadows, you know, above 2,500 meters in the Sierra that we haven't, really touched with assessments because there's so many challenge there are so many challenges to just getting out there you know let alone you know having time or uh, the resources to assess them well looking at the time we're at 359 um, so if there was one last quick question we could take that but it looks pretty quiet on the chat oh we got one hand waving all right we'll go one more fast question. What was one of the hardest research activities you had to do? So what's one of the hardest research activities that you do? Maybe um, Ben and Jeff each give one of your hardest research activities. Um, sure, I can start. I can say for this project, you know, I did a meadow assessment while I was on the John Muir Trail, and that was pretty hard, you know, it took a few days of hiking to get out to the meadow we wanted to assess, you know, and, and once we were out there, we were kind of um, battling time and smoke and fatigue, but it was a lot of fun. Great. I think I, I, think I echo Jeff's point that uh, what's hard is often the most fun. Um, so I've gotten to work in tropical forests um, in very remote places where uh, there really aren't roads, and you have to, like, hack your way in with a machete, and there are snakes and spiders and all kinds of things. And that can be really hard to work in, but it's also an amazing place to get to go to. And so, uh, yeah, that's probably one of the hardest places I've ever had to work. It's uh, It never cools down, and it rains an enormous amount. Uh, but it's a beautiful place to be, too. Good that's question. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, on that note, we'll wrap things up. So thanks, everyone, so much for joining the webinar today, for being out in the field helping to collect data. I love all the waving. Um, stay tuned. I'll keep everyone updated via email. And check out our Facebook page. We'll put updates there as well. I've been recording all of this as we went. So after this, I'm going to see if that worked. And if it did, we'll post it online um, for other folks to see. So, so stay tuned and thanks so much everybody.